Hello, my name's Adam Spring and this is a Remotely Interested exclusive. So, we are going to be joined by our Alan Siler, John Davey and Mark Scott Zickry for uh, an odyssey through what we'll call the the Hulanta Con. So Hulanta is a conference all about Doctor Who and British culture that's been going since 2005. And in 2019, it almost finished. But then something came along in 2020, which was the COVID-19 virus, and Alan decided to continue to go on, this time uh, remotely, ironically enough, uh, via Facebook and hosting a one-day event on the uh, Hulanta banner and Hulanta calendar to... Uh, try and give some relief to people who had, at this time in which I'm recording, been indoors maybe for a while, or at least hopefully, because that was a safe thing to do. Anyway, this will in the future be also featured on the Remotely Interested SoundCloud, where my colleague and partner in crime, Ravi Abbott, and I will be doing what we like to call a transatlantic look at culture, people, and technology. Because the odyssey that we take you through in this recording on sci-fi is obviously something that impacts uh, developers and things like that as well, which Alan and I talk about as you'll listen to in a minute. Anyway, the way this is going to work is we are going to go first with Alan. He's going to basically talk about how Hulanta came about. Then we're going to go into an interview with John Davey, who is kind of like the Swiss army knife of Doctor Who. And then from there, we are going to go with Mark Scott Zickry. And Mark is a really interesting one because he kind of highlights the how do I put it, the charm of something like Hulanta. So it is basically a con which is all about being an Anglophile. And for a British person attending that con, it's really interesting to see how British culture is put out there, perceived, and then transmitted again. And Mark is interesting because he has done so much. He is basically Star Trek Next Generation, Babylon 5, just a list of basic sci-fi canon he has been involved with, in included in this, is the late, great Ray Bradbury. Anyway, uh, that's enough from me for now. You'll hear more when we do this as a podcast in the future. But seeing this, uh, this is Hulanta Day, because this is going out on the day of Hulanta, May 30th, 2020. I thought I would get it out now. And uh, like I said, there's going to be content again over at the SoundCloud, the Remotely Interested SoundCloud. So keep an eye on in the future. And in the meantime, if you fancy it, pop over there and listen to some of the other stuff we've done. Anyway, for now, I will leave you with Alan and myself. Uh, I was working with a friend of mine named Susan. We were working for a different convention 15 years ago. And um, that convention was supposed to take place in June. They wanted to do a one-day event um and we had picked a date in march and this one day event was going to be sort of like a, a precursor to the main event which was going to happen in june um so at some point along the way the um the one day event got canceled and this was maybe you know two or three weeks before the thing was supposed to happen and uh so susan had susan had booked um her mother was a member of an elks lodge and she had booked the elks lodge as a venue to hold this one day event and it was something that couldn't be canceled and the refund i mean the the deposit would not be refunded so she and i were talking and we were like we've got this venue we should do something with it since this other thing's not going to happen let's just do our own convention and uh, she is, was, at the time, the head of the local Stargate um, fan group, and I was the head of the local Doctor Who fan group. So we were thinking, well, let's just do some event themed around those two things. And what are we going to call it? And I thought, well, okay, so we've got time travel and we've got Stargates, so let's call it Timegate. So that's where that came about. The, the date that we had selected... And this was booked, you know, a, a month or two before this was March 26th, which was the day that the first episode of the new Doctor Who series, Rose, went out. So our, our event that just sort of fell into our laps magically coincided with the debut of the new Doctor Who series. 
So it was kind of it was kind of fate. <laughs> <laughs> and you know how how did it grow? Because it obviously went from quite a small affair to something substantial, didn't it? We did we did one day events at the Elks Lodge for the first three years, and it just grew steadily as we did those uh, till the third one, the third year that we did it, we had um, God, maybe nearly 150 people. And at that point we're like, we have got to, we can't do it in this venue anymore. We have to go somewhere else. So I think it's time to book a hotel next year, have a full weekend event and see where it goes. Um, so the first one that we did in a hotel wasn't huge. It was 250 or 300 people, but that was, you know, more than double what we had had before. So that was, that was really exciting. Um, and that first one we did on a Memorial Day weekend. So we thought, hey, it's a holiday weekend. Let's do a four day convention. And oh, that just about killed us. So <laughs> that was the only one that ever went from Friday to Monday. So after that, we went back to a three day model and that was far more manageable. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the more we booked, we didn't have any real, we didn't have any like celebrity guests when we were at the Elks Lodge. But once we moved into the hotel, we started getting actor guests and writers and directors and things like that. And the more we were able to book guests, the bigger the audience grew. Um, the peak was in 2015. And that was when we had uh, Michelle Gomez, who played Missy on Doctor Who. And that was her very first convention. And we had a little over a thousand people for that. So that was, that was as big as we got. <laughs> wow. And my understanding is you also ended up featuring in the guardian, didn't you? In an article, they picked you up. As one of the five best doctor who conventions in America blew us away, completely surprised. And it was alongside uh, other very long established cons like uh, Gallifrey one, which had been around at that point for 20, 27 years and chicago tardis which had been running for like 15 or so so that was that was kind of exciting for us to to be named in such an esteemed group of other conventions and you know you bring up an interesting point there in the there may be people from the uk listening to this and how would you describe the doctor who scene in the u.s oh, that's a tough question um it mainly I was, I'm, you know, I'm thinking as far as like a, the, the larger scene, it really started to grow, you know, in 2005, when the, when the series came back on air in, on the BBC, it was still another year and a half or so before it was televised in America and it was picked up by Sci-Fi Channel. And so I think it was still very much an, I, I won't say underground, but it was very, it was sort of a niche thing up till that point. And then once the Sci-Fi Channel started carrying it, you know, it, it took a little time, but the audience really started to grow. And I think it, you know, around the time of, um, well, of course, everything sort of started to ignite when David Tennant came in. But then I think around the time that Matt Smith was on was when it really kind of caught fire in America. And that's when you started to see like box sets of, the modern series on shelves in Walmart and Target. And that's something that being a Doctor Who fan back in the 80s, I would never, ever have imagined would happen. You know, and it kind of all came to a fever pitch in the, um, around the 50th anniversary. Um, and that's a worldwide thing. That's, I don't think that's just America. That's really when Doctor Who fandom peaked in a, in a major, major way. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, fans here are like really devoted really passionate and have a real love of the whole show and what it means to them and how it brings how it brings you new friends across you know the internet at conventions at local fan groups that kind of thing so yeah i think there's very definitely a um a real strong love for it and what was it like before that? Because my understanding is the main outlet for the old Doctor Who was PBS, the public broadcasting station back in the day. What was it like being a, a fan of old Who or classic Who? <clears throat> I lived in a, I started, the first one I ever saw was The Five Doctors on November 23rd, 1983. Um, I had a friend who 
kept telling me things about this show that sounded bizarre called Doctor Who. And the more she told me, the more I started to kind of like get interested. And she said, well, come over, you know, next Saturday night. It's the show's 20th anniversary and there's a special episode. Come watch it with me. And I thought, okay. So I came over and I watched it and was completely hooked. You know, people say, you know, you always love your first doctor. And my first doctor were the first five doctors. So that was kind of weird. And I didn't understand regeneration. And I didn't understand how all these five actors were playing the same character. And it was just crazy. But I loved it. So um, from there, I mean, I lived in a really kind of small, uh, small town, kind of a remote area. And this one friend was the only person that I knew that knew anything about Doctor Who. Um, and throughout the rest of the 80s, John Nathan Turner, who was the producer at the time, started holding sort of sort of like conventions in America. He was really, really active in um, courting the American fandom. He really wanted to grow the show in the States. And um, so he would have these events in different key areas, um, usually booking like a theater and do a one day thing and he would bring an actor with him and he would bring whatever the latest episodes were that had just aired um, on BBC that the PBS station in whatever market they were in most likely would not have gotten because they always, you know, ran the Tom Baker episodes. So he would come and do these events. And so that was like the, the first one I ever went to. Um, I think the first one I went to was the one that I met Patrick Troughton at um, around, and that was around the time of the two doctors. And I don't think there was one that I went to before that, but anyway, so, and that was, that was incredible. That was eye opening. It wasn't huge. It was you know, a few hundred people or whatever. Um, but they did autograph things. They did Q and a with Mr. Troughton. They played uh, episodes. Oh no, it wasn't the first one that I ever went to was the year before that because the first one I went to, they showed Twin Dilemma. Uh, they showed a couple of Peter Davison ones. They showed Awakening and they showed something else. I think Resurrection of the Daleks. And then they showed uh, Twin Dilemma. So it was the first time anybody in America was seeing Colin Baker. So then the year after that, I, I, I was at the one that Patrick Troughton came to. So yeah, but it was so it was very remote. Fandom was very very fractured, very remote at the time because there was no internet. The main thing was um, the newsletter that the Doctor Who Fan Club of America, DWFCA, they sent out a monthly newsletter. That was your main point of contact. So it was a very, very different time. Wow. And, you know, Who Lanta, as it became, because it's in Atlanta. And you, met, uh, you mentioned uh, Patrick Troughton, and he actually died in Georgia, didn't he? So he actually passed away at the con in Georgia. Yeah. Um, Making that. Um, was it 80? What year was it? 80, 87. Not 87. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I was thinking that's what it was. Yeah. And what's really weird is just today, there was a video that someone circulated on, like posted it up to YouTube. And it was some fan who had a camera who filmed the last words that Patrick Troughton said the night before he passed away as he was leaving the convention floor and going up to his hotel room. Oh, I know. <laughs> That's oh my god, it was kind of filling. Yeah, and again, another one you mentioned, uh, Colin Baker. You've uh, become friends with him as part of the con, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. He's been at our convention twice. The first time was in 2013. We had him over to kind of commemorate the show's 50th anniversary, and that was where I first met him. And and he's he's an amazing guy. He's so friendly and funny and intelligent and insightful and um i just kept running into him um he came to dragon con i think the year right after that and i spent a lot of time with him there interviewed him in one of the big ballrooms you know he did a convention a small convention in um clarksville tennessee so we drove up there and saw him uh took him out to dinner one night so we just, I just keep having these interactions. He was, I think, where else? Uh, oh, he came. I don't remember. Anyways, it's been a number of times that I've run into him and just had some great interactions with him. 
got to hang out with him last year at Gallifrey One um, after the convention was over. Um, he and Nicola Bryant and Daniel, my friend Daniel and I, went out for drinks, and that was incredible. So, yeah, he's he's a really, really wonderful guy. He When we changed names from TimeGate to Hulansa, which was in 2015 or 16, I don't remember, he was the first person that we told. When we were at the convention in um, Na- uh, um, in Tennessee, I was telling him, you know, we were thinking about doing a name change, and you know, where you know these are the reasons for it, and blah blah blah. He's like, oh, don't do that. You've got name recognition. You've got a brand. Don't mess with that. Don't mess with success. Just go with what you already have. What are you going to change it to anyway? And I said, Who Lanta? He goes, Oh, I like that. Okay, you can you can do it then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I you know, I've obviously experienced this as well and how close of a relationship you have with the Who community in the sense that we had the unusual experience of A, appearing on the Radio Time Twitter page and two, sitting down for the uh, latest Doctor, Jodie Whittaker and watching the episode with the director of the previous episode with Peter Capaldi. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because it leads into, you know, your next event. Yeah, definitely. Um, I had got to know Rachel Talalay. Um, I can't remember exactly where I first met. I, I met her the first time at Gallifrey One in LA when she was a guest there, but I had been in touch with her before that. Um, and I tried a couple of times to get her to come to Hulanta and scheduling never quite worked out. Um, but I met her at LA and and she's so nice and such an incredible and intelligent woman she is just brilliant and so i stayed in touch with her a little bit and uh she was in town she was in atlanta um she at that time she was directing an episode of uh, dc's doom patrol uh which was filming here so she was in town to do that and she uh it was the same weekend that there's a, a there's a small horror convention here in town called um monsterama and so she did a little appearance there, uh, you know, since she was in town. She was there on the Sunday. And so I got in touch with her and I said, look, if if you're in town, um, I'm having some friends over. We're having a cookout. Come over to my house and, and let's all watch uh, Jody's debut. And she said, well, I've got this thing I have to do. I have to, you know, I have to be at the convention for the first part of the day. But as soon as I'm done, I'll, I'll head over. And I said, that sounds perfect. So... We fired up the grill and we got the TV ready and I told everybody there's a special guest coming, but we have to wait until the person gets here before we can watch the episode and everybody was cool with it. And then eventually in walks Rachel Talalay, which was amazing. We watched the episode and then we all just sort of sat around on the floor in a semicircle and just listened to her as she recounted stories about directing Doctor Who, which was one of the greatest experiences that I've ever had. I agree. And it's, it's weird. Cause I never thought that I would sit down on the same couch as uh, the director of Freddy's dead and tank girl. So that was, that in itself was unique. <laughs> <laughs> and tank girl just had its 25th anniversary. Yes, it did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. She, you know, Dr. Dr. Who's been doing these tweet alongs where uh, actors or writers or directors or whatever will, uh, they'll, they'll do an episode and they'll sort of tweet, comments and behind the scenes stuff and she and Lori petty did that with um with tank girl which i thought was really cool yeah very cool and she seemed very passionate about it when i was talking to her about it as well it was clear that she had a lot of time for tank girl which was awesome i was just gonna say there's been a lot of talk lately about a tank girl reboot and i'm really curious to know what she kind of thinks about that <laughs> yeah maybe we maybe we can ask her uh, when you when you have the next who lanta 2019, you were thinking about winding it up, and then a little something called COVID-19 came along, and it's kind of changed your plans a bit. I was wondering if you could tell me about that. 2019 was intended to be the last Hulanta. Whether that meant the last ever or the last for a little while, um, it was kind of up in the air. Um, doing an annual convention, especially um, to the sort of the scale that we had kind of got Hulanta to do, um, it's, it's just exhausting. It takes so much time and so much energy and you work on it year round and it, it just, it's like, it doesn't stop. And we were all exhausted. 
and we just needed a break from it. So we thought, let's take some time off. So 2019 was supposed to be the last one. And then this year, the COVID-19 situation comes around and, you know, all public events are canceled. So people have been making the joke that I had access to a TARDIS, dipped into, you know, one year into the future to see what the situation was like, realized it was not going to be any, any kind of tenable situation for conventions. And so preemptively called it off. Um, however, I've just had such a hard time letting it go. It's been nice to not have to spend my year planning the convention, but at the same time, I love doing it so much. And, you know, it was just hard to let go of it. So, um, a number of events have been doing online versions of their you know, usual in-person events. So I thought, let's do that. Um, and literally, I've been thinking about it for uh, maybe a month now, but literally I just made the decision three, three or four days ago. I put it on my Facebook page and said, hey, if I did this, who would be interested? And got a great response to it. And... So, I mean, I, so I started, you know, calling up some people that I know and seeing who I could get to be guests. And Rachel Talalay was the first person that I contacted because she was, we tried to get her for the 2019 convention. And when I asked her, she had just booked another convention for that same weekend. So it didn't quite work out, but I was like, the next time I do anything who Lancer related, Rachel Talalay is the first person I get in touch with. And so I did. She was the first person that I emailed. And I said, look, here's what we're doing. Is there any way that you would be interested in joining in? And she, she's um, in the middle of, well, she's hopefully toward the end of uh, a big project that she's doing for Netflix. And she's heavily, heavily working on editing. And she said she's been getting lots of requests for this kind of thing. And she's said no to all of them. But for me, she said yes. <laughs> so I was like, man, I know. And I, I even, I emailed her back and I even gave her the option of, you know, you don't have to say yes. If you're, if you're just too busy and you can't do it, that is absolutely fine. And she said, nope, it's a firm yes. So we will be doing a, um, a um, through Zoom, we're going to be doing a, a Q&A with her um on saturday the uh, may 30th it is uh, going to be a one day online only hulanta um with rachel palalay uh sophie aldred um john davy who's one of the creature performers on doctor who um dominic glenn who was a composer on the show in the 80s and a couple of other people that we haven't announced yet Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, that's actually a good lead in because I actually recorded a few people at the last Hulanta, the physical Hulanta, and essentially one of those was John Davy. So uh, leading into that, because John Davy is first and then we will come back out and then we've got Mark Scott Zickery. Uh, he will be our second one. Tell us how you actually uh, got John to come along to the con last year. Um, I have been in touch with John for a while. We tried to get him at the 2018 convention and um, I don't know, scheduling or something. It didn't quite work out for that, but he was like, well, I'd, lo I'd love to come. So whenever we can work it out, I will come. In between those two years, 2018 and 2019, I met him at Gallifrey One. So I introduced myself and said, hey, you know, we've been emailing and, and he was so fun. He's a great dude. He would just hang out at the bar all night long and just talk to Doctor Who to any person that was interested in talking Doctor Who with him. And he just, he loves what he does. But he's so cool because he not only does Doctor Who, but he's also uh, a filmmaker and he does stop motion animation and he's done music videos for um, Radiohead and uh, Shaka Zulu and a couple of other big bands. And so he's just a really, really neat dude. Uh, my name is John Davey and I am in Hulanta. And there's a reason why I'm in Hulanta is because I have played many of the monsters in Doctor Who in 43 episodes. So I started in 20, 
uh, sorry, 2005, uh, playing one of the Cybermen, and then I've gone on and been an Ood, Jadoon, Hath, Dalek, Whisperman, Meyer, and many, many, many more. So, you know, I hear a Bristolian accent there. That's right, me babber. Yeah, I've got, I've got links to Bristol myself, as we spoke about before. So, you know, how did you, how did you end up doing what you're doing now, you know, not just on Doctor Who, but you're, quite, you're involved in quite a lot of media, aren't you, in various different ways? I, I am, yes. I, before, or, or literally at the time that I started being on Doctor Who, I was working for a company in Bristol called Collision Films. Uh, and that was a company run by two guys, uh, Chris Hopewell and ben, ben Foley. And uh, I think their story was they both met doing work experience at a Bristol company called Bolex Brothers, which is an animation company. So they decided to set up their own animation company. And uh, my friend Sue Gent, she was working there as a producer. And uh, they got a music video uh, for Radiohead oh, wow. and it was a track called There There from the Hail to the Thief album um, and at the time uh, I was just I was just doing odd bits and pieces of work just flitting from one thing to another but um, photography was my main thing and also filmmaking as well uh, so they they pretty much just needed a runner so I said yeah definitely I'm, I'm up for it um, so I went on set and they uh, they mixed live action and stop motion animation. So Tom York came along and they shot a lot of stuff of him on a green screen. And then they tied that in with um, backplates and stop motion animation. Um, then they, they started discussing about how to actually shoot the stop motion animation because back then most stuff was normally shot on film. Uh, or you would use um, the front end of a DigiBeta camera and capture the images. Uh, and I kind of made a suggestion because I started using digital stills. It was kind of in his infancy back in the early 2000s. Uh, made the suggestion about shooting on digital SLRs. Um, so they said, is that possible? I was like, I don't know, let's kind of give it a go. Uh, so did a few tests and they would pull the... Uh, the still image sequences into After Effects and render them out and uh, yeah, they kind of worked um, and then you know years later now like pretty much or, or I'd say all stop-motion animation is just shot on digital SLRs wow. so um, Yeah, so yeah, I think a little bit of ahead of our time back then well, you know, having spoken to you over the course of this con, you said you're at a Hulanta, you seem like somebody that's a tinkerer that isn't afraid to experiment from what you've described before, you know? So would you say you, you do that a lot, like you're willing to take chances and experiment with stuff? Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, I don't do overly well with authority. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't do overly well with uh, the rules. So um, I kind of always like to look at something and think, well, how can this be done better? Yeah. Um, you know, normally it means doing more work, but that's kind of not the issue. Obviously, um, a lot of people, you know, their uh, mindset in life is, how can I actually do less and earn more money? Um, but, um, I don't know, money never overly motivated me. It's just doing what I want to do and doing something or looking at something and think, oh, well, you know what, I could actually think of a way of actually doing this a lot better and a lot more efficiently. Yeah. And before we get on to Cardiff, I'd like to still stay on Bristol a little bit because one of the things I find interesting from talking to you at the moment is, and having lived there, why do you think there's such a strong media presence in Bristol? Is it because of the proximity to London? Or, you know, wh what do you think it is that makes Bristol such a great media town? Well, uh, BBC Bristol um, is quite famous, um, mainly for its natural history stuff. So, so much of the natural history comes out of BBC Bristol, and they do have a studio there. So, yeah, possibly that made other companies gravitate to uh, to be in that area. Um, also, as well, it's it's got a fairly laid-back lifestyle um, in comparison to London. So, as, as a place to live, uh, you get a, a better um, quality of life, I would say. Um, where, you know, London is great and work opportunities is brilliant. 
Um, but every time I go to London, you know, you kind of got that feeling of that it's, it's all to do with work uh, and not necessarily a kind of lifestyle thing. Quality of life. Yeah, quality of life, definitely. Yeah. So, you know, across, across the water a little bit in Cardiff, how did you get involved with Doctor Who? How did that happen? So this pretty much happened um, at the time I was uh, shooting the music videos. Um, I think it was probably just after we did the Radiohead video. So after that came out, they uh, got a lot of interest because it was a very high-profile music video. Uh, so we started shooting uh, music videos for... Uh, so I think the second one they did was for the Scissor Sisters. Okay. It was a cover of Comfortably Numb, uh, which we uh, shot on a huge, great big uh, water tank that divers used, uh, which was really cool. And then... Um, all sorts, uh, the killers as well. We did a music video for, uh, but between videos, there was periods of time where I wasn't working, so I started doing a bit of uh, background work uh, on TV, uh, and then the agent sent me on an open audition. There were fifty guys, uh, and we spent a day in the Cardiff Landaff Studios. Uh, marching up and down, doing movement work, walking around with her eyes closed, various different things under the supervision of the choreographer Elsa Burke, um, who I then found out was actually in Star Wars. Oh, wow. Yeah, she was in uh, Return of the Jedi. She was in uh, Jabba's palace scene. She was a character called a man -a man Wow. Um, and then I found out that she was also um, in the BBC Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. She played Aslan. So, luckily, she was the front end of Aslan, not the back end. <laughs> <laughs> and no one wants to be the back end of Aslan. Imagine that on your CV, though. Like, <laughs> I was the back end of Aslan. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I got the call and uh, made a trip to Millennium Effects' studios where we got to try on the Cybermen costumes, which was really exciting. Um, and waited for the phone to ring. I got the phone call and then started doing all the Cybermen stuff in series two. Wow. And what's some of your, you know, your most meaningful memories from your time on Doctor Who? Oh, blimey. Um, there's so many. Um, I think it's, it's probably meeting and also seeing actors uh, do their craft. Um, it is absolutely amazing if you get a, an astonishing actor. And normally we're in our monster costumes so we can move our eyes around and look at what is actually happening without our heads moving. And it's absolutely fantastic. And especially with David Tennant as well, just watching uh, David Tennant just tear it up in front of you. It was, uh, it was pretty special, really, yeah, seeing that Best seat in thing. the house. Oh, yeah, yeah. no, exactly. Um, and also... You know, having an interaction with these, uh, air quotes, famous people. Yep. Um, and discovering that they're kind of just... An people. People, yeah. Uh, normal people, and they're nice and uh, helpful. I can, uh, <laughs> I can remember trying to make a cup of coffee uh, when I was wearing my Cyberman costume. Uh, but we had s these big, thick silicon gloves that they didn't always want to take off because putting... Uh, 12 pairs of gloves back on again is quite difficult. So I was trying to make a cup of coffee with these big silicon gloves, and I was all a bit cack-handed with them. And uh, Tracy Ann Oberman was on set, uh, who was in, um, do, uh, which episodes was it? It was Doomsday and Army of Ghosts. Oh, okay. So, or to other people, it was Dirty Den, second wife in EastEnders. Yep. Yeah. And um, I was there kind of fumbling around with this coffee, trying to pour water in it. And she, she just sort of said, like, oh, I'll, I'll make that for you. And I was like, um, OK. And then I'm thinking, like, is, is this right? Am I going to get sacked because one of, the, one of the stars is making me a cup of coffee? But, uh, uh, but yeah, no, it was, uh, it was fantastic. Had some uh, really great fun times. And do you find, you know, the more you do something like that, and regular characters that come on each week, I guess, you know, the Doctors of the Companions, that just those little incidental things help you build up a rapport with people so it becomes even more normalised then? Yeah, it does. Um, obviously, one thing I'm mindful of is that, um, and, and especially actors and lead actors, is that, 
you know, they've got more on their plate than everyone else. So it's always really a case of, you know, don't kind of, you know, approach them or start talking to them, kind of unless uh, they do to you. It's not some hierarchy thing, but it's, the, the for example, there could have been a script change and they got four pages to learn in the morning. So, uh, you know, their, their mindset and their process you know, is really focused on that. But obviously in the, you know, in the downtime, if, if they engage with you, then it's, it's all great. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you get the best seat in the house, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Live DVD coverage. Yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes the best seat in the house is uh, being in a £60 Cyberman costume in the freezing cold in a field. So... <laughs> <laughs> Here's a seat, I'll take it. So have you... Are you mainly uh, Cyberman or do you do other characters on the show as well? So um, I did the Cybermen for the four episodes in season two, which was amazing. It was so good, so much fun. Um, I then got asked back to do Voyage of the Damned as one of the heavenly hosts, um, which was amazing. And I got to meet Kylie Minogue and wow. made an idiot of myself in front of her. Um, uh, being tongue-tied and not knowing what to say, really. We all would have done the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was quite nice, actually, because I was talking to Edward Russell, who's the brand manager, who was also there as well, and he's a massive Kylie Minogue fan. And and I have heard this from other people that I know in the music industry that met her, that she is very amenable and very, uh, air quotes, normal. And um, so Edward was saying, Kylie was talking to Edward about all this stuff, and Edward was... was basically just being quite short with her because the the whole thing kicks in that you're doing your job no and also there's a famous person and you know it's like uh, okay you Go know ahead. what do i say which which i i can understand because sometimes when i come to um events such as this uh, fans will come up and they'll seem tongue-tied and i'm like why, why are you tongue-tied i just, it's, I'm just, just me. A, it's just me i just play the some stupid monsters in a TV show, but I can kind of understand how, how that sort of thing can affect people. Um, but yeah, after doing the Heavenly Host, I, I then did the Ood, uh, the Hath. Um, oh my goodness, what else did I do in David Tennant's? I was a unit soldier, Atmos worker, where you actually got to see my face. Uh, then I was a Whisper Man, Jadoon, um, Vigil. Um, Dalek I became, I became a Dalek as well in Victory of the Daleks oh, wow. which was pretty amazing I was the orange Dalek scientist Oh! so um, the Daleks all had uh, rank so there was the supreme Dalek uh, the scientist the eternal the drone and another one um, there, weren't no, there weren't any backstories for these Daleks so we were trying to make up our own Backstory. These are the big, like, super ones, right? Is yeah. That the one in one of the Matt Smith early episodes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So the um, yeah, so we came up with the idea that the Eternal Dalek basically was just very verbose and just chatted so much it went on and on and on and on. So <laughs> that was our backstory. Maybe someone will uh, will write a write a little uh, story about why the Eternal just talked so much. Um, but that was uh, that was amazing fun and. Uh, um, yeah, and then and got to be a Dalek. Um, and it was quite interesting because the whole scene was shot in a tobacco factory in Cardiff. Oh. And it was in a big steel humidor. So normally um, it's not all set. So they'll try and find a location that will uh, roughly or exactly fit the script. Uh, so we were in this giant humidor, which was very hot. And I think at one point we were in the Daleks for about three and a half hours. Um, and we would normally wear long sleeve black cotton shirts to stop the fiberglass from the inside rubbing our arms uh, and uh, tracksuit bottoms. Um, and it was just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So I decided, oh, sod it, I'm just going to take my top off. I'll take my bottoms off. They're not going to see that. So if you actually watch that scene, the orange Dalek is actually me just in my underpants and a pair of sneakers. <laughs> you, get, you get a different vision watching it than when other people do. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, out of all of those, was it weird, say, going from being in a, you know, a heavily sort of, I guess, in a way, confining suit like a Cyberman and then going into like normal clothing and doing something for a job like that? Because you get used to one condition and then another. Was it kind of... Yeah, because we had to wear the suits for pretty much 12 hours a day. Um, it did put a lot of strain on your body. 
Um, and at the end of the day, obviously, when we uh, got to take our suits off, we were 60 pounds lighter. So it's some sort of like weird mm. resistance training. So even after 12 hours of doing a, a lot of hard work, literally we had this new lease of life and we would feel free to, to run around again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, uh, I think the Sidemen were probably the heaviest costumes. Um, most costumes have got their limitations with sight and hearing, um, being able to eat or yeah. breathe sometimes. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's all good fun. The big advantage with the Dalek, though, it, it does have a bench seat, so you're actually sat down. Oh, okay. So that's yeah. quite nice. Yeah. And I guess, you know, we're here, we're in Atlanta, we're talking a byproduct of Doctor Who. Is it something that never leaves you once you leave set, right? You sort of, you end up becoming part of a, a big family. What does that actually feel like? to become part of that mythos, I guess. Yeah, it's quite amazing, really, because um, when I started doing it, it was literally like that thing, like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a job. And the more that you do it, it's like, well, this is my job. I go and I put a costume on and do these various things. Um, but then there's, there's little moments that just remind you when you're on set, like, oh, yeah, this is actually really quite cool, really yeah. quite special, especially... Peter Capaldi, who is a massive Doctor Who fan anyway, yeah. he would turn up on set, we would be in a monster costume, and he'd get all excited like a little kid and run around and take pictures and have a chat with us. And you kind of go, oh, yeah, it is actually quite special. And then being invited to events um, like Who Lantern and lots of the other ones that I've been to, it's, um, it is quite special, um, especially because... As a kid growing up, I, I was into uh, Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, Doctor Who, most sci-fi things. Absolutely love them. Um, and I haven't, I've never really had any formal training of anything that I've done in my life. Um, because, yeah, thumbs up there. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing is that I'm, I'm heavily dyslexic, which always causes a problem. And the other thing is that I, I just haven't got the attention to listen to someone telling me things that I may not ever use. So most of my things were self-taught, but as a kid, I loved watching all of the behind the scenes stuff on movies. So, you know, I thought, well, I can't go to film school or do any of that thing. So I'll just watch all the, all the making of behind the scenes features of all the movies that I love to get the knowledge on the filmmaking process. Uh, and obviously listen to the experts yeah. talking about these things which now has come full circle because I'm kind of now doing the same thing, talking to the fans. Yeah. So hopefully there's um, some kid there thinking, I'd love to get into the filmmaking industry, but there's no way that I can get in. And hopefully listening to my stories will maybe motivate them and yeah. they will do the same. So you kind of, you know, you naturally and in a way accidentally took what you felt you needed out of the community and now you're putting back into it. In exactly. A way. Peter Capaldi is a really interesting one for me because similar to you, you know, I grew up in 80s Britain, I grew up in Cornwall. Um, and, you know, like the Sylvester McCoy period and stuff like that was my doctor, right? And the thing I found interesting with Capaldi more so than the two, the three guys that uh, preceded him in the new series is he seems to me to have taken it back to the older doctors in a way that the other guys hadn't. And I yeah. think part of that was the fact you just knew that the sort of character was in his DNA, right? You, yes. could, you could just tell it. Was, did you have that feeling? I mean, you mentioned it a little bit on set, but did you kind of have that feeling as somebody that's worked with him in a way as well, that, you know, there's very much it had a massive influence on his life? Yeah, sure. Um, also as well, because Peter was or is very different looking to Matt, David yeah. and, and, and Chris. Obviously, Chris came back, David, Matt, and then it you know, age was obviously regressing. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. obviously Matt's doctor and how that was portrayed is going to be way different to how Peter's doctor is because obviously Matt is that much younger. Yep. So, um, yeah, just seeing, um, just seeing Peter on set and, you know, he, he's, he's got the, the perfect face to sort of yeah, emote these things even without actually saying anything as well. Yeah. Um, and a few times as well, I've, I've seen him on set where um, it, was, it was especially the scene in uh, The Magician's Apprentice with the Daleks. 
where um, Peter comes in in the Davros chair, which when I was on set and I saw it, I was like, oh my God, this is just so amazing. Um, but there was, there was, they just kept the cameras rolling and Peter was scooting around in the Davros chair and this was, this was edited down quite a lot. And um, he, was, uh, he was waving the, the Dalek exterminator around, kind of just totally ad-libbing, just, yeah. just, you know, channeling the doctor in him saying, you know, get back, get back. Do you want some of this? And just literally just letting rip with it. So, uh, yeah, that yeah, was pretty special, really. And how would you say the, you know, being in a, at an American convention and being at a British convention, what would you say are the similarities and differences between the fan base in terms of the feeling of how it's perceived in both countries? Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I think the, the major difference is, is that because it's all filmed in the UK, um, it's more accessible to the British fans. So, for example, you can pretty much every weekend maybe travel one or two hours and probably see a doctor at a, a convention. Yes. Um, which is which is great and amazing for the fans, but when you come to the states, it's not that accessible for them. Yep. So it's it's a huge deal uh, when they're able to get people that have worked on the show over here, um, and obviously, you know, they reciprocate, and all pretty much all Americans that I've come across are so accommodating as well. Um, it's kind of it's it's a thing that you forget because we speak the same language. But as a culture, and even state to state, it is totally different. Absolutely. Uh, wherever you go. And sometimes you feel, start feeling a little bit sort of British and a bit sort of, oh, no, no, I don't need a fuss made over me. And, and why are these people being really over-friendly and, and, you know, over-amenable? But then you've got to remember, oh, actually, sorry, that's a part of their culture as well. So yeah. uh, I do love coming over here because... Um, I'm not the best person in the world uh, for asking for help or being made a fuss over, but then, you know, I come over here and I think it's enforced on me. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, they're like, oh, can I help you with that? And I go, okay, no, no, that's fine, I got it. And it's like, no, we're helping we're you. We're helping you anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one final thing before we wrap up, what's your favorite project that you've worked on in your career? And also, I guess, you know, I'll ask you, who's your favorite doctor? Oh. Favorite projects? Oh, it's, diff it's difficult to say, really. Um, um, doing the first Radiohead video was pretty special because obviously that was my my in as such. Um, also, a lot with with stop motion animation and model making. There's a lot of problem solving, which I really like. Um, because it is, a, it is, it's not always necessarily a textbook thing. It's like, well, this is what we got to create. How do we do it? Um, possibly doing the second Radiohead video, uh, "Burn the Witch," which was a, a Trumpton-esque looking uh, video, um, was great. Once we finished it, because it was hell doing it. It was hell doing it. We only had seven days to shoot the entire thing um, on a very small budget. Uh, the, the director, Chris, is, is very persuasive and he persuaded uh, Radiohead's people to, um, he was like, yeah, yeah, we'll just do this music video for you. They only wanted a little 15 minute short and he's like, well, if we're only going to make a 15 minute short, we're going to have to make some of these puppets anyway. So, yeah, we'll just do, a, we'll just do your music video. Um, I, was, I was starting to panic thinking, uh, um, is he actually getting any money from them for this <laughs> or, or what's happening? But... Um, but that was really good because that was almost the reinvention because the, the music scene kind of declined. Uh, there wasn't any money left in the music industry pretty much. Um, and I think we probably took five years off from making music videos. Uh, and then the second Radiohead video we did kickstarted it uh, back in again. Wow. Um, as for favorite doctors, um, well, my first Doctor Who Doctor was Tom Baker, so uh, as a child, that was that was Doctor Who. wasn't I wasn't aware of regeneration. Obviously, Tom Baker had a long reign, so um, you know, I didn't. I don't think I was actually aware 
really that there was any more before him. It's just him. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and just seeing this this big, confident, loud guy on screen, it kind of kind of appeals to you as a young child, really. It was a real pleasant surprise of who Lanta was actually interviewing Mark Scott Zickrey. I seen him there. I didn't really know that much about Space Command, but you know, he mentioned that he'd worked on a show that I, you know, I really love through other stuff like the Amiga computer that was used a lot for special effects, which is Babylon 5. So we got talking and I ended up having an amazing um, interview with him. And, you know, as somebody like myself, fellow geek about sci-fi, what did you think about his, just his, his deep knowledge of sci-fi as a genre? He is encyclopedic. His, I mean, he's worked in the industry so much and has worked on so many different properties and is a fan of so many different properties. He knows everybody. He knows everything. He's pretty incredible. His, his knowledge is oceanic. So, yeah, he was, he was such an incredible dude to talk to. Thank you for bringing him along because it was just a wonderful interview as you'll listen to in a minute. So we're, right, we're going to go into Mark Scott Zucri now. And Alan, thank you very much for your, uh, for your interview. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me on. Right, we are good. So basically, you know, say who you are and talk a little bit about yourself. Yes, I'm Mark Scott Zickrey, writer, producer, director, author. And um, I've written for tons of shows that are well-known, like Smurfs, He-Man, Super Friends, Star Trek, The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Babylon 5, Sliders, on and on. I also wrote The Twilight Zone Companion and Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities with Guillermo and uh, the Magic Time series of novels. Wow. So, I mean, with such an illustrious career, how did, how did you get into this? Well, you know, it was fun because I, um, when I was 19, I went to the Clarion Writers Workshop, and it was the leading science fiction writing workshop in the country, and I sold my first short story to Damon Knight, the writer who wrote To Serve Man, which was made into a great Twilight Zone episode. And then as soon as I got out of college, I wrote The Twilight Zone Companion to learn how to write and produce great TV. And at the same time, I also, a friend of mine brought me into animation, and I started writing for the animated shows, and that was great, a great place to learn my craft. Wow. Um, out of all the stuff that you've worked on, where would you say your passion lies? Well, I've, I've loved pretty much everything I've worked on, but I love science fiction. I grew up with Star Trek and Outer Limits and Twilight Zone. Those are the three shows that made me want to be a writer. And so, um, so my goal in my entire career was to create a space-going show. And uh, with Space Command, the new project I'm doing, I got to do that. My audience gave me a million bucks to make a new pilot with Doug Jones and Robert Picardo and Mira Furlan and Bill Mummy and Bruce Boxleitner, on and on. And, uh, and, it, and it was just a dream come true. So I've, I'm very glad I got to write for Next Gen, Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine and all those shows. It's all been fun. It's, I'm very proud of my body of work. So tell me a little bit about Space Command, because there's a lot of other stuff I want to talk to you about in a minute, but I think that would be a good place to start. Yes, you bet. Well, you know, I, uh, I grew up with the original Star Trek, and even though it was done during a very tumultuous time with the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights Movement and all of that, Gene Roddenberry had the vision to say we can create a better tomorrow, we can come together, across, you know, we can reach across boundaries and barriers of race and ethnicity and religion and create a future worth living in. And many people were inspired by that to build lives that were meaningful, to become scientists and, and teachers and, 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 and live, live compassionate and meaningful lives. And I, I noticed a few years ago, all the science fiction tended to be very dystopic and very nihilistic. I mean, I liked Battlestar Galactic, but my God, they should have given someone a birthday party at some point on that show. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> you know, but also as much as I loved Battlestar Galactica and, and, and movies like Oblivion and et cetera, they were all very dark. And I wanted to create a show that would be hopeful and create a hopeful vision of the future uh, and not be rose-colored glasses or, or you know, ignoring the challenges of our time and, and the future, but, but would um, say we can, we can create something worth living in for our ch children, for our grandchildren. And so I, um, but I didn't want the studios and the networks to interfere with me. I didn't want them to cut me off at script or cut me off at pilot. Many of my friends are showrunners and they said, let's team up and, uh, and get a pilot deal. I didn't want to have the, the decision of whether the audience would ever see this to be in the hands of the studios and networks. So I'd never raised money, but I had heard about crowdfunding and I decided to try to raise money. <clears throat> and between crowdfunding and selling investment shares of $7,500 each, I've raised over a million dollars, and that allowed me to open a studio, shoot the two-hour pilot, shoot 40 minutes of the second two-hour story. I've written the eight hours of the 12-hour season. We're going to be shooting more and completing the second two-hour story in July. 
and we're continuing to shoot scenes with a bunch of actors, Nichelle Nichols and on and on. Armin Shimmerman's coming up, Gigi Edgley uh, from Farscape. It's uh, pretty much everyone I've talked to has said yes, and it's been uh, extremely gratifying. And how do you think, you mentioned Kickstarter earlier, how do you think now, you know, it's never been easier in one respect and harder at the same time to be a content creator. Yeah. You know, how do you think platforms like that have really helped you shape your vision? I know you talked about it a little bit. Well, you know, I've always, I've always viewed myself as the same as my audience. I've never thought of them as different from me or dumber than me. You know, sometimes you'll hear that from studio executives. No, I'm, I'm the same. I mean, if, I, if I'm excited by something I'm doing, my audience probably will like it too because my tastes are the same. You know, I love Star Trek. I love Aliens. You know, I love uh, you know, on and on. I mean, you know, name all the science fiction linchpins, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Ray Bradbury. I mean, these are, these are things I love and I return to over and over again. Ray was a good friend and mentor. And um, so, so I think crowdfunding, I think... It's funny because when I started, there were three networks, in America, there were three networks and PBS, the public broadcasting station, and that was it. And so, and the only way you could reach a mass audience was via a studio and a network, or if you wanted to write books, it would be via a major publisher. That's completely different now. And all of us have studios. Uh, we have a, a video uh, camera in our pocket, in our phone. We've got um, the ability to edit and do post-production on our computers, and, we have, and we're on the internet, so we can uh, reach an audience of millions of people around the world, and we can raise money t reaching out to that audience. So I'm, I would never go back to the way it was when I started. I love the new, the new model, and, uh, and I'm, I feel very grateful that my audience has given me you know, the money to make this wonderful show that I'm doing now. And what do you feel about that added dimension whereby you can actually be working with the people that you also have an organic relationship with? Because that probably puts an energy into the program yes. as well. Yes, well, I, again, I, I, because TV is my favorite art form, I mean, I write novels and I write nonfiction books as well, and I've done movies, but I love television best. Yeah. And, I, and, and if you're a novelist, you can sit in a room and be alone and be curmudgeonly and not, not have any friends or whatever and, and, and have your vision. And that's fine, and I have many friends who are novelists, but I love to collaborate. I love to work with actors. I love to work with editors. I love to work with um, visual effects you know, people and, yeah. and, and CG artists and on and on production designers. So because I'm collaborative, I love that. And when I was writing, I wrote a book with Guillermo del Toro and, and uh, uh, won the Saturn Award. And through that, I met Doug Jones. And I took him to lunch, and we really clicked. And, I, and you know, for those who don't know, Doug plays Saru in Star Trek Discovery. He was the creature in Shape of Water. He was Pan in Pan's Labyrinth, etc. And um, I, I thought he was terrific, and I said, I'm going to write a role for you. And so I wrote one of the leading roles in Space Command uh, for Doug, and this is before he got cast in Star Trek Discovery. And, um, and he's terrific. He's phenomenal. Wow, that's fantastic. So tell me a little bit, because I'm a huge fan of it, Babylon 5. Sure. What, how are you involved? Well, you know, it's funny, because Mira Furlan and Bill Mummy and Bruce Boxleitner are in Space Command, and that's because I, I first met them on Babylon 5, and uh, when I wrote for it, because Joe Straczynski and I were friends uh, way back in the, in the animation days when, when we were both working on real Ghostbusters and prior to that. Wow. I'm, I met Joe before he was writing animation when he, was, he just hit town and he had been a journalist and uh, wanted to write scripts. And uh, you know, we started talking him up to some of the people we were working with in animation, like the guys at Filmation and so forth. And then he got into animation. We were writing on many of the same shows. And then I, when I developed Captain Power, which was a live action show, I recommended him. I actually said that I would stake him. In other words, if he couldn't do the job as story editor, I would step in. And so that was his first live action uh, story editing job. And, um, and, that, and those producers are the producers who did Babylon 5 with him. So essentially it was all, a, and Ron Thornton, who was the visual effects guy on uh, Captain Power, became the visual effects genius on uh, Babylon 5, who they revolutionized how effects were done on television. And um, it was phenomenal. And I remember going on set and I'd, I'd met Bill Mooney previously. I actually met him when I was seven, and we and I interviewed him when I did the Twilight Zone Companion. But it was great to see him on the B5 set. Yeah. And I thought, and it was the first time I met Mira Furlan. I thought she was spectacular, and I loved Andreas Kutsalas. He was great as Jakar. I took him to lunch when I was a producer on Sliders, I, lunch at Universal, and he told me that I was the only producer who had ever taken him to lunch. Wow. And he was such a wonderful actor, and I, and, so, and we lost him so prematurely, and. Uh, but because uh, I certainly would have cast him in Space Command, and uh, but I thought uh, Babylon Five was a great show. I thought Joe had a great vision, and um, and it really was years ahead of its time. And uh, but with Mira, I, when I met her, I thought I want to work with her again. And I met a young actress named Yelena Mirja, who uh, 
spoke Serbo-Croatian, and I knew Mira did as well. So I thought, well, I'm going to cast them as uh, mother and daughter in, in, in Space Command, and uh, they'll speak, when they're together, they'll speak primarily Serbo-Croatian with a smattering of English, and then they'll talk English to other people. And, and I thought it was really fun to have languages from our world, you know, because you know, yeah. French, French isn't going to die out, Chinese isn't going to die out, just because we go into space. You know, we won't be speaking lingua code or whatever the hell, you know, and, uh, you know, so it's... Uh, it's great. It was. It's a joy to work with these people. And what episodes did you uh, write for Babylon Five? Babylon Five. I did Survivors, which was a first season episode. Because as Joe got up to speed on Babylon Five, he it became clear he wanted to write pretty much all of them, more or less. Yeah. And so I was one of the few writers who um, wrote for the first season. And the fun thing was that I, he gave me the series bible. So I'm one of the few people who has an original series bible from season one of Babylon Five, and it was an extremely um, circumspect. A document because most series Bibles tells you what's going to happen, what's happening to the various characters. It's very clear, but with that one, it said at the end of the season one, at, at the end of season one, one of the main characters will undergo a, ma a major change. And I said to Joe, "Which character and what change?" And he said, "Well, I can't tell you that." <laughs> <laughs> so I said, "Well, then it's going to be very hard for me to write for that character." <laughs> and uh, but it was still great fun and to go on the set and get a photo with the cast and. You know, it just and and uh, John, uh, uh, the the, act, the the head of optic nerve who gave you know who did the makeup, the incredible makeup, gave me the face prosthetic of Jakar. So for many years, I had that on my wall. It was so gorgeous. And uh, and then now it's at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York. Uh, wow. Because uh, there were so few ex you know existing copies of that um, Babylon Five. A lot of stuff got destroyed and thrown away and so forth. So. And um, we've spoken about this uh, off mic a little while ago. But what are your memories of you know the visual effects that went into that? Because it was so ahead of its time in one respect. It was cutting edge. And you know often people forget. You know people will. Uh, bad mouth of the effects on Babylon 5 or the effects on the original Star Trek or the effects on 2001. And these were cutting edge at the time. They were spectacular and, and a revelation. You have to remember that televisions, you know, back when Babylon 5 was airing, televisions were like a big TV was like a 19 inch or 21 yep. inch television. And, you know, and when we started in television was, you know, B VCRs didn't even exist. You didn't have DVDs. Yep. And so like, for instance, when the original Star Trek or the original Twilight Zone were, were on, you know, you couldn't stop a show. You couldn't back it up. You couldn't look at something more closely. That's why when you watch a, an original Star Trek episode and you see that suddenly there's a fight scene and the stunt doubles look nothing like the actors <laughs> that, they're, that they're supposed to be, that's because it was originally on like a 12-inch you know, screen and it went by like that and you couldn't see. You know, you're sitting across the room and you couldn't tell it wasn't them, but now it's ridiculous you know, because of technology. So with Babylon 5, the effects were cutting edge at the time, but now they on a big screen, if you've got a... 65-inch television, it's going to look pretty, pretty primitive. So, you know, Warners should, you know, put in the money to revamp those effects, but they don't own Babylon 5. They merely distribute it, and that's been part of the financial problem, why it hasn't been seen as widely as it should have, and why you haven't had, you know, Babylon 5, the next generation, or, you know, Babylon yeah. 5 features, any of that stuff, because it just wasn't as financially rewarding to Warner Brothers as um, Star Trek was to CBS, Paramount, Viacom. Yeah. Well, I, one of the other problems is as well, because I know Tim Jennison a little bit, who did Lightwave, which was, a, you know, the video toaster and Lightwave were used on it. They don't actually have access to the original film. They're basically re-jigging the yes. stuff that they've got. So I think yes. that's one of the problems as well. But that said, you could still, you know, isolate out those elements and you could, you could make it look better. Even if you couldn't make it look brilliant, you could make it look better. And, um, and also, sometimes when people say, well, we don't have access to this or that, often that's because not enough money is being you know, displayed and suddenly things that were not available suddenly are, or suddenly things that didn't exist suddenly do. You know, um, that's an interesting um, phenomenon I've, I've observed, yeah. I've, I've, I've seen over time, you know, so yeah. So you mentioned a little bit, you know, the real Ghostbusters. Yes. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because I was a huge fan as a kid. It was a great show. I loved writing for it. I wrote four of them. And um, again, you know, we were, we were all a very, very, you know, pe you know ho people think of Hollywood as a doggy -e dog place, but that has not been my experience. My experience has been that we, 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 we hang out together, we know each other, we support each other, we're friendly, we're rooting for each other. Um, you know, when I was a producer on Sliders, I would need some, like, pseudoscience on parallel worlds, and I'd reach out to Mike Akuda on Star Trek, and he'd send me reams of paper, you know, and, you know, and, and we just, we, we're, we're friends, and, uh, and I'm, the, I'm the only writer who wrote for both Deep Space Nine and Babylon 5, but, but we all knew each other, all the writers. We were all young, and we were all very um, ambitious, 
<clears throat> and uh, we'd hang out together. And so when Ghostbusters came out, of course, we all loved it. It was a great movie. And they, they uh, you know, real Ghostbusters started up. And they didn't even have that show out on, on home video yet. So we were sent VHS tapes of the movie, you know, wow. of the movie, so we could see the movie and reference it and get to know it better. And, um, but Joe Straczynski, whose story edited Real Ghostbusters, said, um, I want it to be exactly as if we were writing sequels to the movie. So we're not writing down to the kids. We're just doing what we want to do as if we were writing the sequel. That's awesome. Next. And so that's what we did. And so I satirized television. I satirized the, you know, mainstream culture. I did a lot of stuff. I, at one point, I, you know, I did an episode called Station Identification where all these cre you know, characters from television come out into the world. And I remember it. Yeah, and I created a character that was a combination of Gumby and Rambo called Gumbo. And, <laughs> you know, and so it was, it was just fun. And I was, you know, and I was satirizing Geraldo Rivera and Andy Rooney from 60 Minutes. And uh, it was just, you know, whatever I wanted to do, I could, I could do. It's real freedom. And um, it, was just, it was just great fun. I mean, Michael Reeves wrote, the, wrote a Collect Call of Cthulhu for that. Uh, yeah. So that was a Lovecraft you know, homage, and so, you know, we, there was never anything where it was like, oh, the, the kids aren't going to get this, we never, that was never an issue, we assumed that the kids were smart, and we were doing what was, what we found fun, and it lasted, and we're really glad it did. The mythology that's used in there, like even the Halloween episodes, yeah. it's like you weren't afraid to be dark, you weren't, no, you weren't afraid to all. take it to its roots. Not you know? at all, not at all, no, it's, uh, the main thing we were looking for, pretty much in every cartoon show I wrote, any series, was variety. So you tried not to just do the same thing over and over and over. So the question was always, what can I do that's different? What can I do that's fresh? What can I do that's, if it's, if it's a show of humor, what can I do that's funny? What can I, I mean, a joke that's actually funny, not just the shape of something that's humorous that isn't funny, which is what a lot of television comedy is, you know. And, uh, and we were just all in our 20s and, and just very, you know, we were writing very fast, but, but we were very committed. I, I brought my A game to everything I was doing. I was never sloughing anything off. And uh, and so, but it, but on a show like great uh, like Real Ghostbusters, you had much more opportunity to kind of be outside the the norm, which we all enjoyed. You made a really interesting point earlier about early science fiction writers, yeah. and the reason why I'm bringing this up is because I find it very interesting because science fiction is always seen as a point of reference to a lot of people that make significant changes within society, right? They always see that as a source of ideas. Who are some of your earliest influences, and also as well, who are some of the people that in, in their minds, people might think culturally, because they've made such a significant they've, uh, contribution to a society or a culture, they didn't necessarily have the lavish lifestyle mm -hmm. in their life, you yes. know, that other people may otherwise think, well, you know, these guys would have been in a mansion and stuff like that, but they right. weren't, you know? I know, it's amazing. When I grew up and learned that many of the science fiction writers that I idolized had to actually have day jobs, because back then, you know, a novel might pay $1,000. Uh, they were writing for like a cent a word, five cents a word, 10 cents if they could get it, for Astounding and Galaxy and Worlds of If and, you know, uh, fan magazine fantasy and science fiction. These, they were doing it for the love of it. And so that, and that was what I was paying homage to when I came up with Far Beyond the Stars for Deep Space Nine, where Cisco goes back to the 50s and he's a science fiction writer. But I grew up with all the great writers of the 50s and 60s. I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and I would buy used paperbacks and used magazines and used comics and all of that. And, uh, but one thing that people don't notice, and I have, I have a, my own YouTube channel called Mr. Sci-Fi where I talk about science fiction and the history of science fiction, and um, so people can subscribe to that, and please do. But, um, but one thing that people don't notice is most of the science fiction writers of the 50s and 60s were writing in essentially what was a shared universe of expectations. And the shared universe was, we will land on the moon, we will, we will put bases on the moon, we will colonize Mars, we will move out into the solar system, we will then develop a faster than light drive and colonize the, the galaxy. And, and, and it, was a, it was this hopeful, optimistic view. And it was Ray Bradbury and Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov and on and on. I mean, Ted Sturgeon. And, um, and so it was very, very optimistic. And that's with Space Command, that's the same vision. Sci the one thing science fiction didn't predict was that we were going to land on the moon and stop. You know, and, yeah. uh, and, and I'm so glad that Elon Musk, you know, he's serious about going to Mars. He's not joking. He's building rockets. He's and ways. I hope he makes it before the Chinese do, but I, think, I don't think NASA's going to ever get there because NASA keeps kicking the can down the road. It's like, well, it'll be 30 years. What's well, been 30 years since I was a kid? You know, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. it's never, somehow you never get to that 30 years, that mark. And, um, but Ray Bradbury, as I said, was a dear friend and mentor and just hanging out with him and his great enthusiasm and um, you know and and the science fiction writers were working hand in hand with the scientists at NASA so the space program was very much um, being proselytized uh, by the science fiction writers of that era because when you think about it landing on the moon is not an of course 
It's like, what? Landing a guy on the moon? So you have to have writers creating that future and saying this is what it'll be like and it's going to be really great, it's going to be really cool so that the audience gets excited about it and then wants to, you know, put up the tax dollars to pay for, um, for NASA. And it's funny because so many of the books I read when I was a kid, it wasn't NASA putting a man on the moon, it was like some crazy millionaire who was financing yep. some, some clever kids to like rock, rocket ship Galileo or whatever. And uh, you know, it was, um, so it's funny that Elon Musk has brought that full circle, that model of the, of the crazy billionaire who wants to go to Mars. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, um, but I was reading all of those writers and the fun thing was so many of them were writing the TV shows I loved, so you would see Ray Bradbury's name, or Ted Sturgeon's name, or Harlan Ellison's name, in the books I was reading, but also on the TV shows like Twilight Zone and Outer Limits and Star Trek when I was a kid. So there was an amazing cross-fertilization between the shows and the, and the published science fiction, the written science fiction. And as soon as I was old enough to go to science fiction conventions when I was 15 and 16, I started meeting these writers who were my heroes, and they started becoming friends and mentors like Ted Sturgeon and Harlan. And, uh, and that's sort of where I learned what to aspire to as a writer. And um, it was a great, great proving ground. It was a great place to learn. And, and then when I was older, Ray, Ray, Ray became my mentor. And I'd go to his house once a month, and we'd just sit around and talk about life and art and uh, writing and how to build a career. Um, and I did that every, every month for over 10 years until wow. Ray's death. And uh, it was a, an incredible honor. So I'm writing a book called My Ray Bradbury about that, about my relationship, my friendship with him. It was so uh, unexpected and, and such a gift. Yeah, and you were saying earlier that you may be going through some of his old materials that were yes. released, right? Yes, I'm creating something new called the Showrunners Network, and uh, I'm creating six new shows with six major showrunners, but I also have expanded that to include the iconic writers of science fiction. And so there's a project with Ray that when Ray was alive, I actually, uh, he gave me the permission to, uh, I learned there were 22 Mars stories that weren't in the Martian Chronicles, and so I teamed with Michael Nankin, who was a director on Battlestar Galactica and a producer on uh, Defiance, and I outlined an eight-hour miniseries called Ray Bradbury's Lost Mars that adapted those stories. And, um, but we couldn't sell it, we couldn't find a buyer, and they, like, the executives really didn't care about Ray Bradbury, and it was like, I was astonished. And this sort of led me to Space Command, where I reached out to my audience to finance things, because I knew, I know, if I'd gone out with that project to the audience, they would have financed it, it would have gotten made. And um, so I'm seeing now if, if Bradbury's family will let me uh, take it out again, we'll see. And, you know, if not, that's a shame, but it's, uh, I'm really glad I got the opportunity to, to work on that material. It was a, a dream come true to, talk to Ray and interview him about the Mars stories. I recorded those interviews and uh, um, just, to, just to understand how his head worked and how he put stories together was, a, was just phenomenal. He was a, an amazing writer. Now, you mentioned Guillermo del Toro earlier. He, yeah. He's uh, earlier even. He seems like somebody that's very, he gets to the meats and bones of the story, right? Yes. It's following a passion. He's a great what, guy. <laughs> what was it like working with him? Oh, it was great fun. I um, because I choose people that I want to mentor me. I, I kind of set my cap for them. And so I ran into Guillermo at Comic-Con some years ago, and I just introduced myself. And this is back before Guillermo, you know, I mean, yeah. this is back when he could actually wander the floor at Comic-Con yeah. and not be recognized. So this is just before Pan's Labyrinth. And uh, he, um, and he was a fan of the Twilight Zone Companion, and you know, so we were both, and I was mentioning Devil's Backbone, which is a movie of his that I loved, and is not a well-known film. And um, so then, I did a Star Trek episode with George Takei called World of, World of Time for Star Trek New Voyages. So it was done without a studio or a network. It's through the fans, you know, yeah. the fan film uh, community. And uh, I, I, it took me a year and a half to make it. I put everything I had into it. And uh, I wrote, I co-wrote it with Michael Reeves and um, directed and, and executive produced it. And uh, it was nominated for the Hugo and the Nebula, which are the top awards in science fiction. It was the first non-studio, non-network product. So I was nominated against Battlestar Galactica and Doctor Who <coughs> and Pan's Labyrinth. <laughs> and so because I was nominated against Guillermo del Toro, his publishers reached out to me and said, would you like to write a book with Guillermo del Toro? Wow. And I said, sure. And um, so it was Guillermo del Toro's Cabinet of Curiosities and this big coffee table book about his notebooks and his films and his life and his art and just the whole nine yards. It's this gorgeous coffee table book. And the book, the book is primarily a conversation between me and Guillermo about all of that. And, uh, and I wrote all the interstitial material about his films and his life. And I'm very proud of that book. And uh, it's gorgeous. And I learned from him. I mean, the reason I did the book was to learn from Guillermo. And so we'd hang out and we'd go to Bleak House, you know, and uh, where he has all this stuff. And he bought the one next to that and has more stuff now, and I think he's got one in Toronto now, and he's filling that one up too. And, but he's just, I mean, authenticity 
is really what works for an artist. And if you met Ray Bradbury, he's exactly like his work. Guillermo is too, Serling was too, Harlan Ellison was too. And, and now with the internet, people get the whole notion of authenticity. You know, it's like I'm in my work, well, when I was 10, Ray Bradbury was the first writer I ever saw in person. I saw him speak at the library when I was 10. And I didn't just sit in the front row, I sat in front of the front row on the carpet looking up at this idol, this god to me, and because I loved his work even then. And in that speech, Ray said, ideally, your life and your work and your art should come from the same place. And yep. he touched his heart, you know. And, and I've taken that to heart, and it's guided me. And um, so Guillermo's the same exact way. Guillermo was very passionate, and, uh, and he's wonderful. He's brilliant, you know, he's an amazing man. And who are a few of the other kindred spirits that are still around today in the industry that you like to hang out with and spend time with? Oh, gosh. Um, uh, Rock Neil Bannon is a friend. He created Farscape and Alien Nation and Sequest. He's one of the people I'm on creating a show with on, for the Showrunners Network. Uh, my friend Mark Fergus, who runs uh, The Expanse and he has, in, did Children of Men and Iron Man. He's, uh, we're, we hang out together and we're working together now on a series for the Showrunners Network. And, you know, it's like, it's like I, work, I tend to work, collaborate with my, with my friends and kindred spirits. There's a wonderful artist named Ian McCaig who designed Darth Maul and Queen Amidala and Thanos in the Avengers movie, the Josh, Josh Brolin version, and Mark Ruffalo's Hulk. And he's been, he's been my character designer on everything for the last 20, 25 years. And so he's a, our designer on Space Command and a, just a genius, a brilliant artist. And so, again, we speak the same language. And so, I, you know, I, I just collect people. I, you know, Glenn, my friend Glenn Mazzaro, who was the showrunner on Walking Dead, and now he's going to do the Dark Tower TV show. We, we hang out a, lo a lot. And, um, you know, Michael Nankin from Galactica. I, mean, Ron, I know Ron Moore, of course. I mean, we all came up together. We all know each other. And um, our goal, I mean, it's funny, because many, many of the showrunners, like Brandon Braga and Ron Moore and Vince Gilligan, and, uh, you know, on and on. They read The Twilight Zone Companion when they were teenagers, and it's what inspired them to become showrunners. So when they meet me, it's really fun, because yeah, like, like Mark Fergus, you know, uh, said, I'm a writer because I read your book when I was a teenager. It's like, wow, that's cool. You know, so we, of course we become friends. And uh, they're all huge Twilight Zone fans. And uh, I mean, even Matt Weiner, who did Mad Men, when I, when I produced The Twilight Zone Blu-ray, I did 52 commentaries, and I had this brainstorm of doing not just commentaries with the people who created the shows, like George Clayton Johnson and Richard Donner. I thought, let's do it with the people who were inspired by the show. So I did commentaries with Neil Gaiman, he's another friend, and, uh, and Matt Weiner, who created Mad Men. And I just, it was really fun to get episodes and hear their take on those shows. And, and they, were, they were great, they were terrific. Wow. And Neil Gaiman, it's funny because a lot of people don't know that Rod Serling was Jewish, and people don't know, tend to know that Neil Gaiman's Jewish, or the, and, and, and of course I'm Jewish, and so I did Death's Head Revisited, which is the, the, the great episode Serling wrote for Twilight Zone about a concentration camp commandant going back to Dachau after the war and encountering the ghosts of his victims. It's a terrific episode, so to have Neil and me talk about that as Jews as well as writers, and, and talk about Serling being Jewish, which a lot of people don't know, and the context of the Holocaust in our work and, and so forth was really fun, really, really fun. And it's fascinating as well in the sense that, you know, having access to someone like Neil Gaiman, you then, you tie in with that generation of 80s British writers like him, Alan yes. Moore and stuff like that, they were yeah. also so social commentators in a yes. way. Well, the That's funny really thing is, cool. Neil recommended me to write for Doctor Who, and sadly that didn't come to fruition, but I would have loved to have done it. And, you know, I mean, you know, when you study the history of TV shows, there, there's so many boneheaded things where you say, why on earth didn't they do that? It's like, I would think, given my pedigree, it would be a, a no-brainer to hire me to write for Doctor Who. I'd love to. I've been a fan of Doctor Who since the, the Tom Baker years, you know, the 70s, yeah. and, you know, and, uh, you know, so it would be a great fun challenge to take, you know, that show and see what I might be able to do with it that would be fresh. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, that would be a great challenge. I'd love that. So, and I'm shooting more and more things in, in, in the UK now. Um, we're doing a feature with Lord Peter Hain, who's a, in the House of Lords. And uh, it's not science fiction, but my wife's been hired to write it. It's about his parents who are activists in South Africa. And uh, we're producers on that as well, with two producers in the UK. Fantastic. Yeah, so I'm in England a lot lately. So if there, are, there were five works that you would see as part of your DNA, what would they be? Martian Chronicles, definitely. Um, wow, this is a, we know, a city on the edge of forever. Walking Distance on Twilight Zone, 2001, uh, Blade Runner, and then Aliens for Good Measure. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, I'd, I'd say those. And, uh, and there's many, many others. But, but if you want to know the, all the things I love, just go on Mr. Sci-Fi, and I'm, I post about once a week. And, 
talk about all things science fiction. You can also watch the, the Sulu episode that I did on Star Trek and, uh, and the first hour of Space Command. Perfect. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. <laughs>